Hi, I'm JR, talking to Dr. Robert again, and uh, this one, I suppose. Not again, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Oh, not again. I'll tell you what, we'll talk to that doctor. What are you going to, what are you going to talk about now? Well, we're going to talk about the big one is what we're going to talk about now. But having said that, this is the big one that you've been talking about for the past couple of weeks, for the past month, because obviously with the re-release of Animal Magic, you're quite clearly going to have been talking about it a lot. So I'm going to try not to repeat too much if I can help it. But yeah, Animal Magic is where we are. Okay. I want to come in. Well, it, wouldn't I, be you, it wouldn't be you repeating anything. It would be me repeating everything that I've been saying for the past 38 years about the album. Well, I suppose. Um, no, I'm only joking. It's just that, that um, you know, uh, yeah, I've, I've, had, I've been talking about it a lot recently because of the reissue, obviously. But, you know, it was a life changer, so it's, it's been worth doing. Well, let's have a quick word about the reissue before we talk about the album. Mm. Did you go to... Because um, it's through BMG... And you have a friend who is at the top of BMG, whose name escapes me, but going back to one of our earlier conversations, I don't know if he's still there or not, but one of the founders of BMG was somebody that you knew from RCA, is that right? Uh, Calder Marshall, who, yes. plays, who plays a massive part in this album, or in particular, Digging Your Scene. Uh, I think he's left now, but he was... He was um, yeah, he was a massive uh, influence on, 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 on our career, really, because when, when we signed to RCA, as it was then, yeah. the guy that we signed to, uh, Jack, he, he left um, pretty soon, two weeks afterwards, and to go into rehab, and, uh, as you did. And uh, we, we were signed with, a, with, a, with an album deal, and nobody had a clue what, who, what we were, what we were. We didn't even know what we were, to be honest. But we just, we just kind of ensconced ourselves away in rehearsal rooms for six months and rewrote the whole first album, which was the one we got signed for. But by this time, Corder was slowly moving his way through the great corporate maze from kind right. of making, making tea at the beginning, which is what he did. And it was a guy that you would always see at the gigs, even little gigs like there might only be 20 people. I'd noticed that guy, that face. And he was a talent scout tea maker for RCA. He ended up being our A and R man uh, during this period, Animal Magic, and uh, ended up being the big boss of uh, of uh, well B and G as they turned into. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, and then went on to other things. He had his own label, all sorts. Called as a big player, but a great guy, and not a suit. You know what I mean? A proper a proper music man. Yeah, sure. That's what you need. Well, then you've always had a good relationship with BMG over the years, or at least I assume you have, because BMG have been quite active in keeping your back catalogue current, haven't they? Has been. I don't, I've not really had. I don't really have much. I mean, I'm with BMG Publishing, and I've got a good relationship with the guys there. With the bit, with I never know where we are with the, with the record thing because we signed to RCA, who, got, who turned into BMG, who then got bought by Sony at one point. So. Sony, oh, right. Sony actually own the old Blow Monkeys albums. Uh, I don't know if they know that, but um, because <laughs> and, and they kind of sublet it, so to speak, to BMG for this reissue, uh, right. uh, which is cool. But I never quite know who I'm talking to anymore in in all these kind of corporations. There are only three or four record companies left. Yeah, yeah. Probably Universal will end up buying them all, and I'll be back where I started with Lucian Grange, who's God in the universe. Lucian signed me as a, as a writer before we got signed as a band. For yeah, us, yeah. Publishing as it was then. So yeah, all these guys that I knew, obviously, they're now the big muckers. You know, they're the they're the they're the they're the top cats. But let's go and back. Here I am up a mountain yeah. in Spain. <laughs> well, yeah, and here you are back. Not quite back at the start of your career, but certainly back towards the beginnings of your career mm. and I kind of want to start the conversation before the album because you know I like to try and discover what the mindset was going into something because I like to I like to think about what it was that went into the mix to make a record what it was 
And I want to start with Forbidden Fruit because that came out six months earlier. And Animal Magic as an album, it feels, it's so diverse. And there's each of the songs, there are several of the songs in which various different band members might not necessarily appear. Although, you know, in the case of Digging Your Scene, that might not have been your doing, but something the record company did afterwards. But it feels like a record that wasn't recorded in sort of two weeks in a studio somewhere, but that was sort of like brought together from all sorts of different places at all sorts of different times. But that's not the case, is it? You did do this in a studio in sort of, I don't know, two or three weeks, sort of all in one go. Is that fair to say? Yeah, pretty much. We were working with Pete Wilson and we were working um, at a a studio called Solid Bond, which is owned by Paul Weller. And uh, it was what used to be Philips Studios in the 60s. So Dusty Springfield and Scott Walker and the Kinks and all those guys recorded there it was right on the right on marble arch it was so it's a great place to be and uh and we and so um we were good i think we yeah we were probably only two or three weeks in there you know yeah yeah i think i, think I demoed i spent a lot of time demoing it you know I, yeah i, I think I, I we used to go to a little studio in victoria called the point and we were demoing quite a lot and um you know, and I, I realised that I was I was getting after limping that I was the writing was changing a bit. There was more. I was getting more confident. Uh, I, I didn't ever in my lifetime imagine that we get to make a second album. Right. I thought they'd find out that we were, that we were conning them all along and that we'd be kicked out on our asses. But actually. I started to write things which were influenced more by my kind of soul thing, which obviously had come from living in, in, in a place like Kings Lynn, which was a northern soul town. You know, just the exposure to, to what I was listening to as a kid and see, and, and feeling that start to come through in my writing and using backing singers for the first time. Yeah. Um, Sylvia Mason in particular came down to the demo studios and sang on a version of Digging the Scene, very early version, which was nothing like the, the end thing. And uh, but, but also on things like um, Annually Died Laughing and stuff like that, where, where I thought, oh yeah, God, you know, I can, I can start writing courses with three-part harmonies for girl singers, you know. So it started to appeal to me that the, the soul kind of thing was coming out, you know. But it was, actual recording was pretty quick, I think. I mean, you know, we'd record, Tony, Tony and Mick are real quick in the studio at that time, and, and we would record bass, drums, and guitar all at once. And then wipe the guitars, I'd redo the guitar. Nev, we had to, you know, Nev was more like particular. It, on, on the right time, at the right day, we'd get Nev in, and, and he liked to come in when things were more finished. Yeah, yeah. Getting strings in, you know, I loved that thing about, I loved the days when Pete Wilson is a great writer for string parts. And he would go, yeah, yeah, I've got to write a string part for this and a string part for that. And I would never stop him. I just, and I'd love those days when they came in. I'd just like a big spliff, like sit at the back of the studio and listen to the cello and the violas and the violins, playing my tunes. In, and they'd solo it, so all you'd hear is the string part. And there were these beautiful, intricate, weaving kind of melodic lines going on. And, it, and I was just, I couldn't believe that this was for our record. And Pete was really good at that. Yeah. You know, so uh, and then Neb would come in and blow over the top of all of that because he liked to hear the whole thing, the topping, and it was like raise your game there because he had to, he had to find a spot to fit in with all that. Yeah, he's really actually on the first album he's a bit more of a driving factor. On the second album there are songs where he's more of a driving factor, and then there are other songs where he's more of a finesse, aren't there? And I think yeah, that's Neb, something Neb's that. Yeah, a dark horse, but Neb's. He's inevitable, you know. You, his sound is is yeah. a big thing in our band, and he always finds the space to put something special in. And uh, yeah, and I was listening. I mean, the one particular album I think that I was really influenced by was uh, "Forever Changes" by Love. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I always loved that kind of thing about the garage band underneath, but on top of it, this kind of like. Back right David the kind of production thing, that was the that was the thing. But obviously, you know, it, it developed into something else. Well, there's 
There is massive diversity on this album. We'll get into that in a minute. I'm going to bring something up that you wouldn't expect me to bring up at this point now, because I think this, which didn't end up on the album, and so exists only as a demo, which is on the the new 4CD version of the album, and was on the 2CD version before. Guess I love her. That sounds like the kind of soul song that you'd go on and do later. In fact, it sounds a bit like the one you did on the uh, Dirty Dancing soundtrack, You Don't Own Me. It's not a million miles removed from that. But it kind of has the sort of vocal inflections and the sort of chord progressions that you had on Limping for a Generation. So it feels like Guess I Love Her is like this sort of missing link that kind of sort of glues together your whole career. And it doesn't end up on the album. But I think the reason why I'm bringing it up is because that song kind of is a sort of, and you probably didn't think of this at the time, and it probably doesn't feel like this now, but that song feels to me like an artistic fulcrum around which the rest of the diversity of the album can sort of flow. So you've got things that are so far apart as like Sweet Murder and I Back to Winner in You, and there are the demo versions that are on the album, you know, the two CD and the four CD version of the album. But you've just mentioned that you did a really early version of Digging Your Scene. Did these all start out as sort of band songs and then sort of metamorphose before they became the bands, the songs that you would demo and become on the album? Do you remember the process, I guess? The sort of development of the songs? Well, there would be just there wouldn't be band songs. It would be my solo demos first. On, yeah, sure. Recorded in a little flat where um, I just split up with my first wife, so I was living alone in this flat, Nightingale Lane, Clapham, and uh, I had a t- had a little studio room that we used to call the submarine because it was very long and thin. This studio room, very hard, <laughs> shaped with glass roof, but I liked it, and I wrote a lot of songs in there, and. Uh, um, and because of what I was going through and because we were sort of split up and I was, we were touring a lot, but I was alone a lot there. So I wrote a lot. I wrote a lot of stuff. And I think that Guess I Love Us So is an example of somewhere where I knew that I could get some backing singers in to help. To, to, to I'd said to Cordell, I want to try this, you know. Uh, can we get somebody in for the demos just to see, of course. And um, so that was, that was. The beginning of experimenting with that call and response type thing in the in the in the choruses. Yeah. You know those things like I back to winner. They're always in there because you know I've got a kind of emotional ties to things that I might have seen when I was a kid, and I think that's from that would have been like um, Laurel and Hardy, or there's there's a vocal group called Sons of Pioneers who used to sing on those cowboy movies. And there's, right. and there's one called uh, uh, Water, is it Water? Yeah. And the devil, da, 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 da. And they're all these kind of, they're kind of barbershop quartet things. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, so, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I enjoyed, you know, doing Heaven is a Place, which is obviously a more, almost like a, a precursor to more kind of solo stuff. Um, but those sort of things, I thought it was important to have those flavours on the record, you know. Uh, the one, the only one tune I, I, I regret is, that, and I, I don't know where the demo is, but we, Don't Be Scared of Me was originally a much better, had a much better feel. And I think, I think we, we buggered with it afterwards to try and make it into a single, and it never really was. So I, I think it lost its feel. And uh, it started off as much more kind of funky sort of impressions type thing. Right. Um, Burn the Rich. Burn the Rich was sprayed on the wall opposite where I lived in in in, uh, in Brixton as a slogan. I think you know all the kind of because in Brixton all the kind of anarchists and the crass lot and all that lived there. You know, and I just like. I mean, I obviously I I, I wasn't sort of taking the sentiment rich, literally. But I understood where they were coming from. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Well, and musically, Burn the Rich is like a sort of slightly country and western bluegrass type thing with a big sort of funky feel. That's like a. It's got got bowling elements. It's got. Yeah. It's got. Yeah. And it's got the great Joe Brown playing slide guitar. Slide guitar. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Joe Brown. 
Yeah, yeah. I think you've talked about it before. I think you have. Yeah. When we talked about, yeah, something that you did afterwards, I guess. Yeah. It's, yeah. And that song in particular, I think, really shows that, in fact, the last four tracks on the album couldn't be more different from each other. In fact, this was, going back to what I was saying before, I wanted to ask, was Forbidden Fruit part of those sessions? Or was Forbidden Fruit a bit like Go Public on the first album, something that was recorded earlier and that you used? Yeah, it, was a, it was a connection between the two. And yeah, it, I think we'd started to get some traction in America and they wanted an EP in America for college radio. So Forbidden Fruit was, an, it was a four track EP released in America called Forbidden Fruit, which had things like My America on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Optimist. B-sides, yeah, B-sides, yeah. Yeah. Those things were like written on the day in the studio. I mean, they're just sketches, but, you know, I like that too. Sometimes it turns out. and um, But Forbidden Fruit was the first one. I remember where some good friends of mine, there was a journalist guy, actually, Rob, Rob Chapman, who said, oh, that, that actually sounds really good. This is the first time I've known anybody who says they want to be in a band, and it sounds like you, that might have, be a hit. And, yeah, I, yeah. and I thought, what? Well, and then I realised also that, that RCA said, yeah, OK, yeah, there's a, you've got a budget for a video. You're going down to Canvas Sounds. But you see... Even then, I, it was, I should have been suspicious because they said, also, we've got this girl in the beach. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to dance around with her on the beach. And, of course, I went for it. But I've, I realised now it was the first step towards a place that I had to eventually kind of excavate myself from, which was the kind of the, the teeny bop thing, which... You know, which the, which the sleeves and things like well, the sleeve of that record, you know, like I've said many times, it's I think people think it's an aha record. Um, you know, it's not. Yeah. So I, I had to be really careful of that. But Forbidden Fruit, I think it scraped into the top seventy-five, which for us was a massive deal. Well, yeah, this is this is. I did want to ask you about that, but just on the note of the video, Canvas Sands, it's a bit. It's Rio by Duran Duran on a budget, isn't it? That video, I guess. Part of the inspiration from 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 the records company perspective, they wanted the Duran Duran, but they didn't want to pay for you to go on a yacht to the Bahamas, right? Maybe, maybe, but then the the difference, yeah. But then, yeah, I was never going to fit into that mold, though. You know, no. um, I'm not. I wasn't very good at being uh, kind of part of the happy family of pop thing. I tended to yeah, sort, yeah. sort of hand grenade into the conversation might be something political, might be something else, but I just wasn't comfortable with that. Although I went along with it for a little while. I think Don't Be Scared of Me is the, is the, is the as far as we ever went into that thing, that video for that one. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like Cliff Richard, you know, uh, some right, other right. It's, it's got elements of that, you know. And I was, um, I was keen to, I mean, I went along with it for a while because it was fun. But well, I, and also I, because... I to you before, when... when when we did have a hit with Digging and, and people started coming to the gigs in droves and the teeny bottles turned up, we were still a band that was playing half our music from the Limping for a Generation, yeah. which had been influenced by Laughing Clowns and Birthday Party. And we weren't, you know, Wham or Duran Duran. Well, there's, okay, now there's two big things that I've got to ask. But before I do, I'm going to slip in another one. The Optimist mm. on the B side of Forbidden Fruit, mm. that is to me, Clearly, you 100% ripping to shreds. Morrissey, it's you taking the piss out of the Smiths. I, I swear it's got to be that. There's, that's not a coincidence. It may be. Yeah, you probably don't remember, but i got to say it sounds... It, to me, it sounds like you taking the Smiths, twisting it on its head so you're the optimist rather than the pessimist and just ripping him to shreds. At least that's what it sounds like, which I'll is go, great. I'll go, I'll go with that one, Jay. <laughs> I mean, I I know that uh, I know that it was made up on the day. Yeah, sure. And, yeah, yeah. And, and I had to. Oh, let's do. And I and I know also that I had heard Shakespeare's Sister by the Smiths, which is a rockabilly type thing. I think, and I think maybe I think yes, of course. Right. I think you may be right. I just I don't remember specifically. A lot of these were kind of. Because I was going through that thing where I had, where I was on my own and I'd divorced and I was, a lot of them were kind of, were, were sort of 
self-positive kind of mantras to myself mm. as well. There was, there was a lot of that going on. Sure, yeah. It was exciting. I realized something was happening and things were changing, but my own life was in a bit of turmoil, to be honest, which is probably, at that point, quite a good thing for writing, but n not for mental stability, particularly. Well, on the subject of mental stability, Forbidden Fruit, you've just said mm. there were people saying, oh, this could be a hit. Mm. Do you remember if Forbidden Fruit was actually out at the time you went in the studio for Animal Magic? I'd assume there's only six months or so between the two, so I can't imagine that it was. But can you remember if there was already a little bit of buzz about Forbidden Fruit? Because I just wonder if at the time you went into the studio on Animal Magic, you were already thinking, oh, we've got a bit more budget. We've got something that perhaps wasn't quite a hit, but, you know, it was for the American market. I wonder if you went into the studio, your emotional life might have been in turmoil. Your sort of home life might have been in turmoil. But your band life seemed to be stepping up before maybe you even quite got into the studio. So can you remember if you went in with a sort of positive attitude about what was going to happen next in your career? I, I always do. I mean, I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember the chrono chronological kind of uh, yeah when it came out and where we were in the recording process. But I do remember thinking, uh, being really genuinely excited by what what I was hearing back. You know, yeah. uh, I remember thinking when we did Airplane City Love Song and we and I listened to the strings and the brass and. A guy called Louis Jardine came in, who was a Brazilian maestro on the, and he played with everyone, you know, he was a percussionist. And uh, just, we were getting top quality players coming in. The guy, um, what was his name? Pete Morrissey came in and played, you know, he was like a stalwart of the kind of jazz scene, the, the English, like, you know, Ronnie Scotts and all that. And he was, he came in and played on Heaven, Soprano Sax. And all these players coming in and they were like quite complimentary about what they were listening to and all that. I just had, I remember thinking, yeah, it's just, there's a buzz. I mean, I think we might have ended up mixing it in Good Earth Studios, which is Tony Visconti's studio on Dean Street. So we were in right in the heart of Soho. And we'd come out opposite the French house, which is a famous pub in Soho. Uh, in the middle of sort of Bohemia, really, yeah, and it yeah. felt like, oh, we've arrived. We, we're we're part of this. We belong, you know. And uh, and I, yeah, I did feel confident about what we were doing. But the big step up was when we did digging. That was the difference. Yeah, sure. So, and I mean, you've been asked about that song so much, and in the last couple of weeks or so, you've been asked about that song even more. So I'm going to ask you something that's obviously been asked before, but quite apart from what the song's about, the record company replaced the drums and the bass before they put the song out. Do you remember, as a well, band... It wasn't as a, the record company, it was me. Oh, but, but it wasn't... Uh, it, well, you hadn't decided to do it. It was kind of presented to you and you no, said I, yes I, or no. I, I agree. I, I went... The quick story is that Corder Marshall said, go over to America and remix Dig In. Do a remix. See what we yeah, get. Yeah. Go to Arthur Baker's studio. Unique. I knew Arthur Baker. Didn't know him, but I knew of him. Yeah, yeah. So I, fl I, I flew over there. This would have been in 85 when we were recording it. And I went over to New York on my own for a couple of weeks. And I went into Unique Studios and there, were no there was nothing in those studios that I recognised as being like a studio. There was no booths, there was no instruments, there were just lots of samplers and MIDI leads. So wow. this, was, this was a whole new way of making records. And there was a guy called Arthur, uh, Michael Baker, who was working with, with her, who, who, was, who was to do the remix. And uh, him and Axel were, were really on it. And the first thing they did and what they'd always been doing was to make it and what I could, what I thought was going to be a dance remix at first, was to put the Lind drum on, which was the which yeah, was yeah. essential piece of kit, and replace the bass and drums, and add a few more backing vocals, stuff like that. But was there ever any sort of point at which you thought, "No, they can't do that," or was it always, "No, if it's right for the career, it's right for the band"? Well, I thought initially it was for a remix for a dance remix. Yeah, yeah, and then. I pretty soon realised, no, this is a bit more than that. Uh, and no, I mean, I, you know, I was ambitious. I thought, yeah. 
I, I thought, wow, this sounds like a hit. This sounds like a hit. This could be great. And it, to be honest, you know, it, it benefit. Okay, for Mick and Tony initially, I, I think. I mean, we talked about it, and I don't think it was hard. But I think what it gave us, because it was a hit, and because it's such a big hit worldwide, it changed everything for us. It meant that we became. We we had a career. Yeah. So and I and also you know. I'm not too precious about that. And the, but what people underestimate, and I've said this to you before, is the strength within the band, the family feeling, the yeah. that we have because because we all started together, and because I mean they believed in me so much as a writer in the early years, even though it, there was no reason to, and we had nothing going on. So there was a strong bond, especially with me and Mick and Nev. Tiny joined just before we signed, so it was a little bit later. But even so, very strong family bond still is. Yeah. So. Um, no, the positives far outweigh the negatives. And then the other thing about that song, and I'm going to come back to the sort of the sort of family feel in a second, because I think there's a biggish question to ask about that as well, or there's a big point I want to make. But then the other oh, thing about all very big questions. Uh, well, yeah, it's a big album, right? It's the it's the it's kind of the launching of your career, really. I mean, it's not quite, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So, but digging your scene. Mm. I can remember at the time when I first heard it thinking, oh, there's something about the gay scene, about AIDS here. But I don't remember there being much of a fuss about it. And I don't remember reading reviews where they talked about it. And that seems to be something that people seem to have picked up on afterwards. Can you remember if at the time you were asked much about that? Because I, I don't remember that being the thing at all at the time it came out. No, it wasn't something that... We put even, I don't remember, but I don't think it was even in the press release, particularly. No. I think it was, I think there might have been like, <laughs> from RCA's point of view, they, were, they probably said, well, let's just, let's just, you know, not. Stick it out under that, the radar. That isn't going to get us Radio 1 playlist particularly at the moment. Because you have yeah. to remember that, that, that during the, that period, there was a lot of bullshit and scaremongered stories about AIDS. It was, the, you know, the government. Thing. It was slightly earlier, but it was it wasn't a great atmosphere. So I don't think they wanted to make such a big issue of that. I did when I talked about the song, and someone would ask me what's about, it, and it was pretty obvious. Mm. God's Revenge being quite a famous line from that kind of what 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 you know. Well, and Clause Twenty Eight had been yeah. just before then, hadn't it? I think I'm trying to remember the timeline, but it must have been around about the time. Yeah, I think it was just just around that time. Yeah. And so there was this real, there was a real sense. And I've got to say, one of my favourite films of all time is And the Band Played On, which is a movie that sort of encapsulates the whole, it's about the scientists are trying to figure out what AIDS is. Right. But it, but it's a big, sprawling TV movie that takes yeah. in the whole thing of what was going on at the time. And I do remember there was, a, it just, well, it was Thatcher's government, wasn't it? It felt like they were persecuting people for the sake of persecuting people because it's a case of divide and conquer, isn't it, sometimes? And we're seeing that repeating itself again now, aren't we? Us and them is the oldest trick in the book. Yeah, exactly. But also, right. you know, I mean, people were not as open-minded about, uh, you, you know, gay culture as they are. I mean, now it's it's a very different world. There were different problems, but it's a very different world. So, um yeah, and it, I mean, you know, like, it's just a song, though. It wasn't, Yeah. You know, it's just like, it's like them banning, celebrating that we did with Curtis. It's, it's pathetic. It's hardly going to well, put the bloody government down, is it? You know, it's not exactly, you know, no. it's a simple song. So, uh, it, yeah, it's just, um, but there was a lot, obviously that was, yeah, I knew that when I, when I came back from New York with that, 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 that things had changed. And then going back to the other question I was going to ask, and this is about things changing. I don't think there were... You did two TV things. I think there were TV things. I'm going to grab it. Mm -hmm. The first one then was released on VHS and DVD. And I know you're not fond of the appearance, but it's... There you go. Mm -hmm. It's the London Live thing, mm -hmm. which, as I understand, was a sort of late-night TV programme that they later released on VHS. Mm -hmm. And that's taken from about the time of Animal Magic. And you're already, several of the songs from Animal Magic are on that set. And it's an uncomfortable set. 
because you can feel that you're not quite comfortable with several of the songs you're playing. And you've said to me before that you hadn't found yourselves then. And so you're not especially happy with that gig and with that, with that video. Yeah. But then in 1986, in New York in the summer, MTV film a gig at the Ritz, which, you know, went out on MTV. And the difference, and it's only a year or so apart, the difference couldn't be more pronounced. You go from, in the first case, being this uncomfortable band who haven't quite found themselves and don't quite know what they are. And the gig at the Ritz, I don't know whether you've watched the whole thing lately, but you are, it's just an absolutely joyous experience. You can see how much, I think there's seven of you up on stage because there's two girl singers and there's the guy playing the toms. There's seven of you of you up on stage and you could not be having more fun. Mm. So I guess what I want to relate back to the album is, was it during the making of this album or what was it around that time? Do you think that, t was it this that turned you from a band who weren't quite sure to a band that were having that much fun? Uh, well, in between those two gigs, we had a hit with digging. So, mm. uh, and it's got to be more than just that though, hasn't well, it? Or is it? Yeah, but no, but what that led to was suddenly a, a whole glut of, TV performances around the world, because it was a hit everywhere, tours around the world. So by the time we, that New York gig, we toured America by then. Yes. Yeah. The end of a tour. So we're in, we're in prime kind of, and um, we were, we were at the top of our game. So that's how quickly it all changed from that, in that year we, we had, we had never stopped playing. I mean, we, I mean, Actually, from that point on, we never stopped until 1990 when we broke up the first time. We just, that was one of the things. We, we just kept playing, we just kept touring, we just kept playing. And, and so you find your feet pretty quickly if you, if you just keep playing night after night after night, especially yeah. in America where the, you know, the bar is quite high in terms of like showmanship and musicianship. They're really, they're on it. Even yeah, a little, and so uh, we had to be two, and so I had to kind of start to invent, not invent a persona, but I had to, uh, I had to back myself. I had to become slightly larger than life because of the way we were portrayed and the way that, especially the video for digging had gone down in America, which was big. You know, I had to go out and, that you know. But I, it wasn't. It wasn't. I didn't go to some kind of rock school and learn how to do it. It was just an extension of of, of what was inside. And that very early one at the Camden Palace, we were we weren't ready. We were nowhere near that. And that's how quick it can change. Yeah, yeah. That's how quick it can change. It's just uh, you know, it's just it, the bottom line is hard work. You just keep going. You just. You put them. You put the work in. It's like training to be a sportsman or something. You have to train. You have to work hard. You have to keep get. You know, play guitar every day, sing every day, practice, do every gig that's offered, and all of a sudden you're on a different plane. All of a sudden, yeah, flowing. Do you and, know, I... and you stop. You're unfit for a while again. It's quite. You know, we're about to start again at the end of February. And we haven't gigged since November. That's not that long. That's only three months. But it feels like, oh, yeah, I can feel like I'm going to have to blow the cobwebs away. But I don't like that. You know, I like to keep playing. But we were, we had been, we were, we were very much fit by the time we got to New York. Now, on the subject of you and sort of, you know, everything that's going on around, and talking about those sort of TV appearances and gigging around the world and that. I remember at the time you had a reputation in the press for being a bit of a spiky character. That was how they categorised you. And they've done this with other people before. I remember they did this with the Stone Roses when they first came out. And maybe that was with good reason. But looking back, the, the, the interviews you did in America on TV that have turned up on YouTube and in Japan and all that, you're being sarcastic, but you're not being sarcastic from a place of sort of 
spikiness, yet it's clear now from this distance that you're just a young man who's enjoying what's going on around him and doesn't want to be boring and doesn't want to be bored and is just having a bit of fun with the questions rather than somebody who's deliberately sort of setting out to sort of obfuscate what the interviewers are trying to get to. I don't know, can you remember that? Can you remember what your sort of mindset was, how much you were enjoying those things? I think it's the same as it is now. I mean, I just, I... I... I'm not, so without sounding kind of like pious, but I'm not nasty. I don't, no. I don't have, I don't have the, like Van Morrison, apparently. Right. Genius artist, not a very nice man. That's okay. That's okay. You separate the art from the artist in the end. I think you have to. But um, I wouldn't be being myself if I set out to be nasty. But no, I can no. be. I can be lippy. And, and yeah. I, also, I, I, I'm very aware of the absurdity of it all. I kind of had one eye on posterity when I was doing those anyway, because I thought I never knew that one day the YouTube would be invented or anything like that. But I was aware that this is kind of ridiculous. You're asking me silly questions, but well, this is a game we're playing, and none of it, yeah, yeah. Matters, none of it really matters. It's all just nonsense, and all that really matters in the end is will the records stand the test of time? Will if, will people like them? Will they affect somebody's lives in a way that music has affected mine? Because, you know, and um, and if they don't, fine. But if they do, that's great. You know, so it's a. Uh, I think it was always that that kind of realization, the to not take yourself too seriously, it, but, at think, same, but at the same time take your work very seriously. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there with the word absurd. I think it's kind of a slightly absurdist approach to the interviews that keeps them fresh and interesting. Because, I mean, you know, if you were just to talk about the process in the sort of most dull of sort of terminology, you wouldn't make for a very good interviewee. Not at that stage of your career, at that point. No, I, think sort of... gotta, I, gotta, I think you've got to play along and you've got to, mm. you, you know, you, I don't want to belittle anybody or, or take the piss out of them but at the same time they know and I know that this is a game yeah yeah you know well, and, and uh, you know and, and and then when they you know especially on that kind of light-hearted television kind of stuff you know I mean I thought we did the um, American Bandstand with uh, Dick, Dick Club. No, uh, yeah that's it yeah <laughs> and um, I hadn't seen that actually for years and it turned up on YouTube and what I love is Mick in it, our bass player, who has got no fun, no, doesn't, all right, mate, he just says to him, you all right, mate? As if he's just bumped into the bus conductor in Walthamstow. You all right, mate? Yeah. Uh, he's just totally unaffected, you know? And, uh, and Neb, the sax player, is very taciturn. He, he's not a man of many words. He's, yeah, yeah. You know, he's Scottish, he, he's hardcore, but hard goal. People get completely the wrong picture sometimes because the way he is, but that's just the way he communicates. He protects himself and communicates. And my thing was more like, you know, yeah, Mister Abullion, Mister Funny, Mister This and That. And uh, but I knew I looking at Dick Clark and I was thinking, you know, there's no one home. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like it's like when in between when the cameras go off. I've met a few of them like that. Noel Edmonds is one. There's no one home when the camera goes on. David Bowie said that when he met Bing Crosby and he did that Christmas song. Noel Edmonds' they daughter said, went to the same school as my stepdaughter. I'll tell you a story about him off the air. Yeah, well, you know, I wouldn't be surprised by anything, but I, but, but it's all about ambition and fame, and there's nothing much there beneath that. So um, I'm not saying Dick Clark was like that, but I got, I'd never met that level of kind of waxwork before. Well, yeah, it looks like a robot or something on yeah. that clip. Yeah. So odd. Mm. Now, changing the subject slightly, there's the album. Away from away from Noel Edmonds, you mean? Well, yeah, absolutely yeah. away from Noel Edmonds, please. <laughs> the album, it's got this... It's kind of a tale of two halves, I guess, in a way. You've got things on there like Don't Be Scared of Me and I Nearly Died Laughing, although that's got a... Slight cuss word in it, so that was never going to be a single, not in the 1980s. And things like Aeroplane City Love Song, they're sort of pop songs, mm. and there's a sort of a 
jingly jangliness to some of them as well. So they kind of got that. They're very much of the time. And then there's things like Sweet Murder, I Backed a Winner, Burn the Rich, that are not of the time, but are timeless, mm. I guess, and very much different. So then Dig In Your Scene is this hit. Mm. And, I mean, it was it was massive. It was ubiquitous. It might not have gone top ten, but it certainly exactly. felt like it did. It was absolutely ubiquitous, mm. and you couldn't escape from it. Was there much question about what you'd follow it with? Was that one of those long, deep, dark conversations that you had? Or did you always know that Wicked Ways was going to be next? No, I... I um, I it was a big thing. It was obviously, oh, my God, you know, what we're going to follow it with. There's nothing else like it. So we yeah. to, they, the, the record company, and we talked and we talked. And I wish that I had stuck to my guns because I wanted heaven as a place. I thought, let's go left field. Because I thought, and I think I was proved right in the end, that go with your best song, not what you think is a hit. No. So, and I thought that was the next best song. And so uh, it probably would never have been a hit. But on the back of Digging, it certainly would have had a listening. And if it had a chance to get on radio, I think it would have been quite interesting. Instead, we went and we remixed Wicked Ways and it kind of scraped into number 44 or something. Yeah. And, and the same with Don't Be Scared of Me. So they weren't, they weren't, they were kind of trying to be shoehorned into a Digging Your Scene type space and they weren't really made for that. So uh, there was panic, I think, amongst the record companies about, well, are you going to be able to have follow this? I, I think you're heard, right. Until they heard, I had doesn't have to be this way quite early on. I'd written it by the time we were touring America, we were playing it on that tour. Yeah. Um, so I knew that, that I, I knew, that's the only one I've ever written where I thought, yeah, that's a hit. That is a hit. And uh, so I knew that we were going to have that and it would be all right. But there was, yeah, there was that kind of thing. And um, I wish that if I had really put my foot down, I could have insisted on heaven as a place and I wish I had. I think it would have been a hit, you know, because I think there's a thing about bands that if you try and follow up something with something that sounds the same or similar, yeah. I think that does go against you because people are, a lot of people are like, well, I've already bought it. So why would I want to buy it again? And while Wicked Days, Wicked Ways is different enough for the general public, they might not have seen it that way. Whereas Heaven is a Place is such a beautiful song. Mm. And I think there was a market for songs like that, even at that time. I think it would have been a much bigger hit possibly, than Wicked Ways possibly, was. Possibly, yeah. I mean, it just shows you, go with your strongest songs. Go with mm. your feeling, go with the songs. You know, and uh, it, it, that's always, since that time I've tried to do that. Obviously, we've, that hasn't always worked. There have been times when uh, whenever we try to shoehorn or construct a single, it's never worked. You know, I just I just couldn't do that. Some kind of wonderful is probably the big example of one that you sort of, as far as I'm aware, the one that you sort of probably ended up wishing you'd never done. Is that right? I don't know. Yeah, we'll get to that. it was. It was. I remember somebody walked in the studio and said, "There's a film called Some Kind of Wonderful being made." John, what's his name, was making it. Uh, John they, Hughes. They, yeah. They, they need a track. Can you do one? And I just improvised there and then. And the, the, the producer flipped and started writing a drum track around it and blah, blah, blah. Before we knew it was done, it was, I would never have written a song called Some Kind of Wonderful, let alone, you know, so... No, it was... Um, but, but, you know, I don't regret. I don't regret, but I know it's not our greatest moment. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, it wasn't really uh, the right move to make again. You know, you should have been brave and gone with something else from to follow up. I know out with her was probably the right choice, but after that we should have gone with something like cash or something like out, you know, don't give it up or something. Just just to shake it up a bit and show the other side of what of what we do. Because um I've really grown to to hate making those compromises in order to try and get on radio two playlists or whatever it is that you're trying to do. You know, it's a nonsense. Is there anything then, because I've got to say, I think it's a wonderful record from start to finish, basically. And actually, don't be scared to me. I uh, Don't be scared of me. I think it's one of the highlights of it. That was always my, or not my favourite, but one of my very favourite tracks back in the day. So actually, I that song did appeal to me. Is there anything on there that you don't like, though? Anything that you felt disappointed in? On, on Animal Magic? Yeah, because it's such a strong record. I think it's one of... I, 
I just don't know why it doesn't have a reputation for being one of the classic albums because I well, think it, it's it is. Beginning, it, weirdly, it's beginning to get one now. <laughs> yeah, as, too late. Or as no, as well, not too late, but you know. it's never too late. You know what I mean? Because because it's not because yeah. it's, it doesn't have the classic '80s production values. I mean, you know, Ghost of Daughter does. It's, yeah, it's Lindrum and it's full of synths and it's full of like tinny CD level mixes and everything's. Animal Magic was pre that, so it's 90 percent of us of that record is the band playing. Yeah, yeah. And there's no extra guitarists. There's no except for digging, obviously. We we so it it's, it has a kind of timeless quality to it um, in terms of its sound and the styles as well. The styles are timeless too. Yeah, I like I, the... I like the actual the title track Animal Magic because it's got a cool kind of course where the where the where the tempo changes to half time i uh, love that yeah i like that kind of thing um and and pete wilson makes the strings dance around them and, and yeah no i mean i, I uh and, and he it was pete he got the the barbershop quartet in uh, i back to winner who was, was singing in his local pub and they came in and um wow and and uh, they were great um, no, I mean, like, the only one, like I said, that I don't really like is Don't Be Scared of Me. But then, but then you know, I can't, that's only because I, and I'll find it one day. The original demo was much better. Yeah, sure. You knew what it had been or could be. Yeah. And so it's the version that's on there that's not. But then, so that's the one that fell slightly short of your expectations. Mm. What about the rest of the album? Is there one particular song that overachieved on what you thought it was going to be so much that it stands out maybe? Oh, I'm trying to remember what's on it now. Um, I think, well, I'll throw you a nomination, perhaps. Sweet Murder. I think uh-huh. that's just epic. You like that? Yeah, I really like that. When I, I remember first putting the record on, and you had Digging Your Scene, Animal Magic, and Wicked Ways. And Animal Magic does the halftime thing in a chorus, and I've always liked that. So that one particularly stood out of those first three. But those first three are all sort of kind of funky pop songs in that sort of slightly soul way so it kind of felt like i knew what was coming and then animal and then sweet murder comes on and it's just it's enormous it's a big sound on a big song and it's like whoa something happens there and after that all bets on that record are off so yeah i think sweet murder whatever you thought it was when you sat down and started writing it i think that turned into something else in the making of it and there's lots of different versions and they all capture something of it but i think it's the version on the album that's just spectacular mm. i can't remember i wrote it in the kitchen of my little flat i think <laughs> i think i was uh, of, uh, in, in nightingale lane i think i was jamming on the kind of you know that kind of yeah, yeah there's a track from there's a it's called the wizard by by and it's it's the first T Rex album as opposed to Transos Rex album, and it's a uh, it, j- it just jams on the E chord jink, 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 with a, in a kind of yeah Bo Diddley would be the other would be the initial yeah the root the root cause of it all would be Bo it's Bo Diddley's fault, um, and then I'm thinking and then of course you know the X factor is E commerce. You know, yeah. Mr. Mouse, the man himself, who was uh, still alive, a phenomenal human being, the hu- a human kind of synthesizer, and all that stuff that he did. And uh, I never understood a word he said. You know, we did a gig with him at the fridge in Brixton, and he's six foot seven and he's towering behind me. And he's saying, <laughs> you know, he's saying something about how he likes sweet murder. And I'm going, yes, mouse, no, mouse, whatever. Because I couldn't, he was a scary cat because he had a lot of people around him that were kind of criminals, let's be honest. Right. You know, um, anyway, phenomenal when he appeared behind the curtain and came on stage when we were playing the fridge in Brixton. And one of the, and Michelle captured that moment. You can see there's some great photos she took of Mr. Mouse coming out. Um, the, and, and I had heard him on John Peel. That's how I, you know, got into his thing. And also because I lived above. No, yeah, the shop in Brixton. I moved there during that period to Brixton. It was the riots. And so, um, yeah, I, I get that. I, I think Pete Wilson did a great job on that. He made it sound 
big, and I think it's the first time I ever played um, uh, a wah wah pedal. And uh, so, you know, guitars, 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 guitars. I mean, like, like I've, there's been a talk recently. Somebody are uh, talking about my guitar playing. Nobody ever picked up on it, and nobody ever said anything about it. So I presume that's okay. I mean, I'm not a guitar hero, but I think when, especially when I came to do the kind of solo acoustic gigs later on in my career, people didn't, people were kind of, didn't know you could play guitar, but they hadn't been looking. I've been playing guitar on all yeah. the records. That was me. I wasn't, I, I, I didn't do myself any favours by posing around on sort of the post, probably. They probably thought I was like Paul Young or something. I don't know, that, you know. Yeah. No, no, no offence to Paul, but you know what I mean? Have you heard him play guitar? Um, but I mean, but, but uh, forbidden fruit for crying out loud! The well, guitar on that is gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what I, that's what I'm saying. I was stretching myself on the guitar on this record, yeah. and the new way of playing a bit. I think and from from where I was on limping, well, on limping, I was being obtuse with chord changes and and time changes and learning and learning in public. By the time I got to Animal Magic. I figured a little bit more, I'd simplified it a little bit, but my, I got better feel purely because of what I said earlier, we've been, we, it was non-stop playing, you know, yeah. just a, one or two gigs is, is like doing um, three months worth of rehearsals, you've known this, you've played, it's just everything is elevated, everything suddenly becomes, and you feed off the reaction and you start to, before you know it, you're in, you're in a new place, you're in a new space. So like like you said, that what happened in that year where we went from playing the Camden Palace to the Ritz in New York was purely because we never stopped and we just kept. Uh, we were we were growing so fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a magical record! Is there? Oh, thank you, man. Um, is there? I'm <laughs> pleased. It, uh, it's a, it's a pleasure that. That if you can get one or two away in your career that, that feel like that, and I think if you if you had to do my top five, that's in there, if not right at the top, because I realise that now. It's just some records hold together and stand up, and I think that's one. Do you know that? Yeah. So, OK, a question that's not related but kind of is. As you go through your career, because I've found this, I think, when you make the next thing, you mm. always think, oh, the last thing was rubbish compared to the thing I'm doing now. Mm. Did you did you get to a career, a, a point in your career, where you're thinking, oh, animal magic, that was a bit rubbish. I'm so much better than that now. Yeah. Or is it always, you did? Oh, yeah. I couldn't listen to it for years. Wow. Any of it. Especially early 90s, when I did around about the time of Realms of Gold. You know, I, I had to take a different path and go away from that and I didn't listen to it and when I did listen to it I could only hear faults and yeah. I, I could hear a guy that I thought was trying too hard in the singing it wasn't this it was overproduced you know I got into a new but of course as time goes on everything everything just melds into one great long lifetime experience and you put it in proper perspective and I think oh yeah no, that you know we were great. We were good, you know. Not just me. Mix, mix, mix a phenomenal bass player. He was coming up with, you know, the lines that he plays on things like um, "I Nearly Died Laughing." And they're very unusual. Yeah, yeah. They're 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 elastic. They're rubbery. They're sort of liquid. Yeah, yeah. They're not right. <laughs> Animal magic <laughs> um, too. Uh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, of course I do look back. I mean, right now I'm right in the middle of, which is why I'm probably. I'm right in the middle of writing the new album for the Blow Monkeys, and I've got, I've got it now. I found the direction, but at first I was struggling because I know that Journey to You was a good one, yeah. and I don't want to repeat that. I, I, I don't want to repeat at this point any of it. So I've got to find new something even. So, and that again is just like you've got. To, I think every. I, I, I saw it with Nick Cave talking about. He was the first two weeks of writing a new album. He was he was unbearable to his wife and he was unbearable to his friends and, because he hadn't found it yet. He, but he but he had to he had to work he had to do it had to do it and that's where I'm at. I have to do it and I have to find a new way of saying something new. 
And that's just keeping your eyes open, your ears open, your senses, and trusting in the process that it will, it will come, it will flow. And then you're in a new space, and then whatever that takes, you know. And then it's really exciting because you think, right, well, I'm not going to repeat myself. I'm going to make this really sparse. I'm going to make this really dead. I'm going to do whatever we're going to do, you know. So, um, yeah, so I've digressed a bit. But that's, that's the, the creative process is the buzz. That's the sure. buzz. Because that makes you feel connected and alive. And every time you've moved along a little bit, onto a new project, you've learned a little bit more, you, you've learned, you know, you, you know, if you're alive, if you're, if you're open to, to, to new experiences. So, stand by. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I can't wait. Well, I'm going to have to wait, but... <laughs> well, yeah, but... I mean, we, you, we, I think we're going to... Yeah. I think there's all sorts of things. We're, we might do a new, a new compilation album first this year with a new single on it, and then we'll do a new album next year. But also the, the album I made with Matt is coming out as well. So, yeah, it's plenty happening with lots of gigs and all that. So, yeah, it feels good. It feels good, although this, this time of year is um, it's tough, isn't it, for people? Yeah, but, you know, I've got something to look forward to because I've got a ticket to see you in a fortnight. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I'll tell you what, let's give somebody else something to look forward to as well or something to enjoy. I got that I made myself a copy of the Ritz gig from the New York. I will put a link on your Patreon page when you list this underneath so that people can go and watch that themselves in case they've not seen it or in case they've not seen it for a while because obviously that's a little bit naughty but I want to share it since it's something that's worth sharing let them sue they let them sue and if they do I'll put them on to you well if if the worst comes to the worst they'll make me take it down right so you know people might get a chance to see it before that happens but keep it to yourselves um, if you watch it well I can't keep it to myself if I'm putting it on Patreon but I will share you know, I will. Don't, put, yeah. I'll share it so that you don't get in trouble. No, listen, I don't mind. It's fine. But that, 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 I've, oh, okay. I've never, do you know what? I've never seen it. So. It's, oh really? Yeah. Oh, it's well worth I mean, seeing. It's, it's not the best quality copy, but I got what I could get, and I stuck it together. Meantime, let's decide what we're going to do next time. Well. Next time might not be us, but that's a cryptic clue as to something that might happen. But the next time we are together, I think we should talk about this, because you put a couple of demos out from this lately, and this is another one that I really, really like. So let's talk about If Not Now, When. Okay. Which I think... Well, we'll get into what I think about it and what you think about it, but I think that'll be an interesting one to talk about. Until then, thanks again, Robert. It's been great. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheers, I'll man. see you again soon. Take care.